if you look at the history of physics, right, physics has been a fantastic export field. That's, you know, populated molecular biology, it's populated, you know, quantitative finance, it's populated lots of kinds of things. It has every opportunity to populate this area and to populate and to really make some complete change to how one thinks about sort of meaning and language and so on, I believe. Is there a kind of a narrative story of what LLMs are finding? Um, is, there, is there a way of saying, why do LLMs even work? It's not obvious that, you know, given that you, you know, it, it, you could say, take a sentence, like, the cat sat on the, okay? Based on just looking at pages on the web, you can reasonably guess the next word is going to be mat. But by the time you've got a long prompt where you're asking it some physics question or something, there's, there's, there's no way that actual detailed text is going to be somewhere on the web or well, probably not, unless it was some exercise or a book or something. But um, uh, most of the time, it won't be something that was on the web. So you have to have an actual model that allows you to extrapolate. The model that's being used in ChatGPT is a neural net. It is far from obvious. There's no fundamental reason to think it would be true that the way the neural net extrapolates will agree with the way we humans think it makes sense to extrapolate. The fact that it extrapolates to produce things that seem meaningful to us humans is a non-trivial scientific result. And you know, I think what it's basically telling us is the way brains work is actually pretty well modeled by, by sort of neural net type things. And that's why the things that brains extrapolate with are pretty close to the things that these simple neural nets extrapolate with. So then the question is, well, okay, we've, we've got this kind of extrapolation that's going on. We've got some, this thing is, is finding out some way to extrapolate. How is it doing that? Well, what regularities in language is it picking up to allow it to make meaningful sentences, meaningful text? Well, there's one big regularity that we know about in language, which is syntactic grammar. We know how you put parts of speech together, nouns and verbs and things like this. So in a sense, we can then construct sentences which are syntactically correct. But there are infinite number of sentences that are syntactically correct, but complete nonsense. Um, and that's, it's doing much better than just producing syntactically correct sentences. So what's it doing? Well, there's one good example of a place where we know a structure in sentences that exists that isn't uh, sort of purely syntactic, and that's logic. And you can kind of think, you know, when Aristotle invented logic back a couple of thousand years ago, you know, what was he actually doing? Well, he was a bit like a machine learning system because what he was effectively doing was saying, I've got all these examples of rhetoric. People make an argument that looks like this, but I can take something which instead of it being a discussion about, you know, Sparta and Athens, it can be a discussion about turtles and fishes. It doesn't matter. I can just replace those symbolically with P and Q, and I can look at the sort of formal structure of these sentences. In a sense, you can lift logic out of the specifics of, of, uh, of, of actual language, in his case, Greek. But uh, and in a sense, what LLMs have done is they've discovered the same thing. So people say, oh my gosh, it's amazing. You know, LLMs have discovered logic. Well, they discovered logic, I think, the same way Aristotle discovered logic, and you can find out they're basically doing syllogistic logic. Um, and if you try and feed them things which require sort of more formal, more formal kinds of things, even at the level of you know, parenthesis matching and so on, they will fail after you get sort of too many parentheses to match. They don't do kind of the formal level of things. They don't do the computational thing. They do the kind of level of things that that, in a sense, was the original way that logic was discovered. So that's a place where kind of one's able to lift something more semantic out of this kind of layer of pure language. But presumably, there is more that can be done along those lines. Presumably, there is kind of a, a semantic grammar of language, which, in a sense, the, um, uh, this, um, you know, the LLMs have discovered something about language and common sense reasoning and so on, that is that there's this, there's this sort of thing you can lift out of language that allows you to kind of put together meaningful stuff uh, that beyond just the purely syntactic. And I think that's, that's the thing where, well, I've been interested in this actually for a long time for different reasons, this kind of idea of sort of making a symbolic discourse language that allows you to, to sort of express things in a, uh, uh, in a kind of, in a, in a way that is uh, sort of is a symbolic way of expressing things that is not specific to the particulars of language. In a sense, the whole enterprise of making a computational language has got a certain distance with that 
describing certain kinds of things in the world. But anyway, I think that there are many pieces of kind of what happens in LLMs. For example, why does few shot learning work? Why does it work to tell LLM an LLM to talk like a pirate? Why does it, how does that manage to place it somewhere in meaning space or something so that the kind of, you know, you placed it somewhere by giving that prompt, then somehow the semantic law of motion takes over and it successfully manages to produce semantically meaningful stuff. We don't know how any of this works. It's a great topic for physicists, I have to say. I'm, I'm, uh, I think it's one of these places where uh, it, is, it isn't particularly easy. It's something where, you know, this space of, you know, this sort of meaning space, what we're looking at with these images, we can sort of see things about what's out there in meaning space in a way it's a little bit easier than with text and words, but we're kind of, you know, this is sort of just the beginning of, in a sense, physicalizing, using something like statistical mechanics to try and analyze what, what's, what's happening inside an LLM. So I think kind of to sort of summarize, I mean, I've, I've talked about two kinds of things. One is just the very practical aspects of using LLMs to, I think the, the most significant workflow there is this. You have a vague idea of what you want to, what you want to uh, do. Now I have to say, to get that vague idea, you have to have an ability to sort of think computationally about things. Until you can express yourself in some kind of, sort of, with computational concepts. I mean, it's no good, uh, you know, th with, with some, some notion of how you think about the world computationally. Once you have that, you can kind of write a piece of natural language. You go sort of tell that to the LLM. The LLM will then write, uh, you know, will write Wolfram language code or whatever, sometimes correctly, that um, uh, will be an expression of what it thought you meant by the things that you said in natural language. Now, sometimes when you look at that Wolfram language code, you'll say you misunderstood. It wasn't correct. You can fix that code, or you can tell it to go fix the code, or whatever else. But so the workflow is, you know, computationally imagine what you want to do, write it in natural language, have it uh, kind of translated into computational language, then read the computational language. It's very important. It's something you can do with Wolfram language. No other, you know, that's, that's the story of computational language, very different from programming languages which weren't intended for, for humans to read particularly. Um, but so that, that's something where you, you read that computational language, you understand what it said, you fix it if you need to, then you say run that, then that becomes a sort of brick that you can use to build a whole tower of, of, uh, of, of what you want uh, on top of. And so that's, that's, I think that's the workflow. And, and you know, I have to say, as, as we make these, these uh, chat notebooks better, it's getting closer to the point where it actually makes sense, even if you know Wolfram language well, to try and use it as a way to get things started if you're not thinking very clearly, so to speak. Although, as I say, to get the prompt right, you have to be kind of think expository writing, because if you're totally confused, the LLM will be confused as well. But anyway, so the, the first thing I was talking about was, was this idea of how do we make use of LLMs, mostly as a way to kind of get a leg up on creating kind of computational language to be able to, uh, uh, to, to, to um, actually do computations. I should say, by the way, there, I'm happy to talk about this, people are interested if we have any time, but, but um, the, um, uh, you know, there's many use cases. Like, for example, uh, we're working on a bunch of AI tutoring applications. Another, another use case I mentioned for physics, we've never been able to do, in Wolfram Alpha, for example, we've never been able to do physics word problems. We can do that once you've turned the word problem into equations, for example, we can, we can nail it. But turning, going from the whole long textual description into the equations is not something we've been able to do. Now we can. Uh, now, in fact, in practice, when you use LLMs, one of the things that's terrible, you know, you use the, the, the for example, a chat notebook or, or the uh, uh, Wolfram plugin for ChatGPT, it'll sometimes, you know, correctly untangle the word problem uh, you know, solve the equations correctly, and then at the last minute, give the wrong answer. Because it, it tried to inject something that it thought it knew and it got very confused. But anyway, so lots of use cases for kind of the LLMs, their interaction with computational language. And then the second piece, really quite a disjoint piece, is why do the LLMs work in the first place? This is a physics problem and people should figure it out. And the result of figuring it out will be many important things. For example, probably most of what's inside a modern LLM doesn't need to be there. 
most of what's, you know, the actual structure you need to know enough to be able to do sort of a linguistic interface plus uh, kind of enough common sense to support that linguistic interface is probably quite tiny compared to a current LLM. And probably you can delegate all the kind of computation and detailed computational knowledge outside of the LLM, which is an important thing in practice in terms of how much it you know, costs to run an LLM, what kind of systems you need to run it on. But if we understand LLMs better and why they work in the first place, we have a better chance to be able to resolve those kinds of things. 